This is a podcast from the South China Morning Post. Hello and welcome to the US-China Trade War Podcast. I'm Finbar Birmingham on the political economy desk at the South China Morning Post here in Hong Kong. As we speak, China's top officials are huddled in the huge Great Hall of the People in Beijing, hearing all about the country's policy agenda for the year ahead. The big news here in Hong Kong is the creation of a national security law which will give China much more authority in Hong Kong. This year's NPC also marks the first time in history that China has not set an annual economic growth target, a mark of how much pressure the economy is under. All these come as US-China tensions ratchet up and up and up. In this week's show, John Carter and Joe Shin, our political economy editors, will parse the details of China's policy plans and how it might inflame those tensions. In the second half, I'll be speaking with Jim McGregor, one of the most incisive China analysts around. Jim spent many years as a journalist in Taiwan first and then in China before becoming a very well-regarded and connected consultant. He discusses the worst US-China dynamic in his long career. This interview is loaded with insight. Stay tuned and I will see you on the other side. It's Friday afternoon and I'm here with John Carter, Joe Shin, the political economy editors at the South China Morning Post. As we are talking, the National People's Congress is happening in Beijing, two months late due to the coronavirus outbreak. This is the annual policy setting meeting of the top Communist Party officials. Joshin, we were writing and looking at the the scenes on the television today. Tell us, are there any surprises to come out of the of the NPC this year from your point of view? Oh yes, uh, Fingbao, this uh, NPC is certainly uh, very unusual uh, by China's own standards. First of all, it has been delayed, as you said, by more than two months. Uh, Usually it's in March, but now it's in uh, later May due to the coronavirus. And secondly, it's uh, uh, much shorter. Uh, you know, uh, the MPC for this year will last only for seven days instead of usually 12 days or even 14 days. And when you look at uh, the scene on the Chinese state television, it's very interesting because, you know, you see all the delegates wearing uh, masks while all the state leaders, even on the same roof, they don't have to wear masks, you know, kind of uh, privilege or kind of a style like... Uh, um, uh, Trump, you know, all his aides has wear masks, but the president don't have to wear any masks. And also um, very uh, important, of course, in terms of content of this MPC is that we see a clear shift from the priorities. Usually the MPC is about, you know, uh, the great achievements of last year and the biggest uh, hopes or wish list for this year. But this time is different because, as we all know, Chinese economy is in trouble and, you know, there's really nothing really to celebrate. Uh, so, um, one important thing we should uh, take note from the work report today is that Li Keqiang uh, said in his government work report, which is the shortest in, in the last 10 years, I guess, uh, mentioned employment uh, for nearly 40 times in one hour speech. And that's something that shows, you know, how uh, Beijing is concerned about this uh, situation. And of course, uh, another big change is that it has no GDP target. I, I think John will give uh, uh, us a more clear explanation of why Beijing does that. John, that's what we were looking at for. Um, it was fairly uh, well predicted that they wouldn't name a growth target for the year. Explain why that's the case and why is it significant that they haven't done that? Well, it's the first time in their history that they haven't set a growth target for the year. And this growth target is the benchmark against which all of the local governments uh, set their own growth targets and their own work plans for the year. And so with no target, it makes it difficult for local governments to figure out exactly what their policies for the year need to be. Uh, Obviously, they will get some direction from Beijing, but it will be uh, more difficult than it has been in the past. There is no growth target because... Beijing is unsure what the economy is going to do for the rest of the year. As we know, the economy contracted by 6.8% in the first quarter compared to a year ago, the first contraction in the economy since uh, 1976, so more than 40 years ago. Second quarter is iffy. It could very well contract, which would put China into a technical recession, which is two consecutive quarters of negative growth. But for the full year, even then, we're unsure what it's going to look like because there's so many different uh, unknowns. Uh, 
Uh, we know that uh, uh, the economies of Europe and the United States are going to be very weak in the next couple of quarters because of their own battles with the coronavirus. And so demand in those places for Chinese exports is going to be extremely weak. And we're already hearing stories of orders canceled or orders not filled. Um, and that is likely to increase in the months ahead, which, of course, will put downward pressure on China. And domestically in China, a lot of the service businesses are struggling to come back. Many are trying to open, but customers are not coming uh, because of worries about their job and income, because of worries about getting the coronavirus. That's just one of the uh, risks that they face. And in, in addition to the risk of a second round of coronavirus infections, which would lead to further lockdowns and which would lead to a further downward pressure on the economy. Yeah, um, I'll bring things Super local before we go international. The big news from a Hong Kong point of view from the NPC was the introduction of a national security law uh, from Beijing, which will give China much more authority in Hong Kong. Um, a quote from the SCMP story last night, um, the law would ban all seditious activities aimed at toppling the central government and external in interference in the city's affairs, as well as target terrorist acts in the special administrative region, sources say. Now, this is obviously a, a huge thing for Hong Kong, but given that this is the US-China podcast last year, whenever the uh, Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act was passed in the United States, it really did stir the pot in terms of US-China relations. John, we've already had responses from Nancy Pelosi, from Donald Trump on Twitter, coming out against this uh, very ferocious language, criticizing this um perceived uh, in, in the United States as a, a power grab by Beijing. Right. How much potential is there for this to really inflame things at such a desperately bad time for the superpower rivalry? Well, already, as you know, the U.S.-China relationship is taking a pounding because of uh, a number of factors. The phase one trade deal that isn't being fully implemented yet. Uh, the blame game for the origins of the coronavirus. Um, a series of smaller actions uh, like, for instance, a new law that looks like it will pass Congress that would per, would throw out Chinese companies from U.S. stock exchanges if they don't obey certain rules on transparency. It, it, it's a, a series of things that are deteriorating the U.S. relationship. The, the Hong Kong law is, if it's passed, it's expected to be passed would be just one more irritant in an already very irritated relationship. Uh, the, the, down, the worst case scenario here is that Kong, Hong Kong is treated differently in terms of trade than mainland China is. Uh, all of the tariffs that Trump has put on Chinese exports to the United States do not apply to Hong Kong exports. That could change in, in the Hong Kong Democracy Act that you referred to allows the president to change this if he took away Hong Kong's special trading privileges, it could potentially have a severely dampening effect on the local economy and in turn on China itself because a lot of the investment that goes into the mainland China flows through Hong Kong because of uh, the, the many benefits that Hong Kong has now, including the rule of law. Firms are just more comfortable doing business here. If that disappears, um, it could have dramatic economic effects on China itself. Joshin, at a moment when China is, you know, the, the, all of these opinion polls show not very popular on the world stage, is falling out with um, with its trading partners left, right and centre. I want to ask you about what we've reported as a growing appetite among uh, within China and a growing debate within China about whether the country should become more uh, isolated. Um, is that expected to be a hot topic over the course of this NPC? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Fingba, you know, the NPC is traditionally mainly talking about China's own domestic affairs, but the worsening international environment, uh, uh, notably the co confrontation between China and the United States, has become, uh, as the phrase goes, you know, the biggest elephant in the room. Although, you know, many rooms in the great half of the people are big enough to have many, many elephants. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the China-US one is certainly the, is, the biggest 
Because it has undone lots of preconditions for China's development in the last four decades, which means the accommodating international uh, environment. And now we do see that Chinese government is preparing for this. You know, the, the leadership, including President Xi Jinping, is talking about how uh, a volatile, more uh, risky uh, environment is going to uh, happen in the in the coming years. And also, China is preparing for that. For instance, a few days ago, China released. A grand national development plan, you know, focus on the western areas, uh, the the inland provinces instead of the coastal areas. But one uh, thing that uh, I would like to uh, stress is also, you know, it, it's not either or. You know, China is uh, still on one hand, it's 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 more inward looking. It tries to develop its own domestic market. It it is looking at its interior uh, regions. Uh, you know making its uh, uh, manufacturing facility more tailored for the domestic months. On the other hand, it is trying also very hard to maintain uh, its relevance in the global value chain as long as it can. So for, uh, so, so for now, China is just doing its uh, uh, on both sides. Uh, we, we can see that the Chinese government has been uh, also, while you know, developing this uh, Western area, has also been uh, re- uh, reiterating it's opening up uh, pledges, and it's also I can say it's loading uh, you know red carpets for foreign investors who are still mm-hmm. willing to put money into uh, uh, China, and also China is not necessary is going to be uh, a complete loser in this uh, global value chain realignment. As we had this China conference a few days uh, ago, one of the uh, speakers has mentioned that maybe you know as the world is getting more fragmented and more risky. Uh, China's uh, centralized control system, you know, which can offer a kind of uh, predictable and also stable business environment, maybe that's something being will be uh, welcomed by some investors because, uh, you know, if you get into the market and you know there's a market demand and then you know that you can get these uh, good treatment from the government, so maybe that's not a total uh, disadvantage. All right, well, it looks like another rocky and explosive week ahead. The time as we record is almost half past three in the afternoon, so we've got another few hours before President Donald Trump wakes up and probably throws a rocket in what we've recorded <laughs> for the week. Um, but, Joe Shin, as you were saying, it's um, the, the law uh, on Hong Kong security law hasn't been passed yet, but it's ex- expected to pass next week, right? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm not an expert in this area, but according to this one, uh, it's... As John said, it's, uh, it will be passed at the MPC. And then this is just the first step. A lot of things still uh, is up, also involve Hong Kong, you know, how to do, do this law. And it is still uh, many steps away from actual implementation mm-hmm. in, in, in Hong Kong. Yeah, no doubt. It, was, it is going to be dominating the news cycle over the coming week. John Carter, Joe Sin, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Delighted to be joined today on the podcast by Jim McGregor, who is the chairman for Greater China of APCO, a consultancy, spent many years reporting from China and Taiwan as a journalist and is known as a very insightful person on all things Greater China. Jim, I wanted to ask you, have someone who's been in and around China, in Taiwan and in mainland China since the, the late 80s, early 90s, the past few months have really seen a significant escalation in all things um, US-China rivalry, China's general rivalry with other places in the world. In all of the time you've been focusing on China, would you say this is the the most, the most, lowest point in, in China's relationship with the rest of the world? Well, it's absolutely the lowest point in China's relationship with America. Um, I think for the rest of the world, it's a mixed bag, depending on what country and what yeah. region and China's relationship with them. But the U.S. China, this we've we've hit bottom, and um, I think that um, both countries are looking at each other and saying we've had enough. I'm sick of you. Um, I think the U.S. feels the U.S. kind of feels betrayed, both the business community and the government, because they look at you know over the last thirty some years. Um, a lot of goodwill went towards China, opening our mar- markets, opening our universities, scholarships for Chinese students, uh, bringing in all kinds of expertise on building a legal system, on and on and on. And now, you know, the, the view is that China was very cynical in using us. And now that they got it, it's like, OK, see you later. Now that's that's the view in Washington. I don't completely agree with that. But that's, the view is, this, you know, China used us. Now it's time to push back. And the pushback is is far from coordinated and far from strategic uh, out of Washington. 
Yeah, and you were you were obviously, as I intimated at the very start, you were in and around China in the late eighties, early nineties. So when I've been speaking to people, there's a lot of this language about a new Cold War or a different Cold War. People saying it's the lowest point. Even the Chinese, uh, one of the departments in the Chinese government, had a paper comparing it to Tiananmen Square. The the fallout of that. Do you think this is worse than that? Certainly in terms of U.S. China relations. Well. It, it, Let's think about this for a second. Um, yeah, on, on a political front, the U.S. and China have never been at such loggerheads mm. since uh, Nixon put it back together. But there are so many ties between the countries um, just below the surface of the political rhetoric. I mean, think about think about the the business ties. I mean, the um, you can hardly get in a taxi cab in Tianjin without the guy telling you about his cousin in Chicago. You know, everybody's in business together. Uh, the families. You know, our, our U.S. China people get along very well. Um, they go to school together. Our kids get married. You know, there's all these deep ties, and actually, not a lot of enmity between the people. It's the difference between the the political systems, and both political systems are run now by extreme people. Mm -hmm. uh, they're both run by strong men. One that is a dictator, one that would wish to be a dictator, um, and it's all about them. And so this. This U.S. China thing is now leaking into the U.S. election, and it looks like China is going to be the third candidate that both, you know, both Biden and uh, Trump go against, um, and that's not going to make it. That's not going to make it much better. But I, I do think that I don't know if it's a Cold War that was, you know, that was trying to upend each other's systems. I think they're going to have to find an accommodation, and yeah. it's, it's not it's not going to come quickly, and it's um, not going to be uh, neat and clean. But I think that's what's going to have to happen. And America just has to get it together. We got to quit whining that somebody's doing something to us. If you want to deal with China, compete with China. If China has a thousand talent program, America should have a 10,000 talent program. If China has made in China 2025, let's have made in America 2025. Mm. Let's go, you know, let's invest in our own technologies. We've been just sitting back and, and complaining. We need to get our get it get it together and, and compete and then that, actually if we get it together and compete that might help bounce things out on both sides so do you think that's possible like i mean there's certain areas i guess in terms of cost and terms of labor and we know that the cost of labor and the cost of land and stuff that's all been rising in china but it's still nowhere near what it is in the u.s on what front do you think you mentioned maybe a, perhaps an industrial policy is that something you think that the u.s could compete with china on where where is that possible quickly well actually uh, if you look at the um, the American economy any economy is built on industrial policy and protectionism the American economy the the boom of my generation I was born in the 50s is from World War two when when the economy was built by a war production board run by a Sears executive during World War two everybody came together with the government and business all one seamless thing almost like China is and they built the the war machine that later became the consumer product machine. So this we're at the end of the Reagan era where it was government is a problem, little government, um, you know, free markets solve all problems. That's complete nonsense because we're built on industrial policy. And actually, it looks like Washington is starting to wake up to this. Just in the last couple of days, uh, Senator Schumer and, uh, and some Republicans have put in a bill um, that looks like uh, Made in America 2025. It, it's talking about putting a lot of money into industrial policies and into research for quantum computing, AI, mm -hmm. and kind of all the things that China is focusing on also. Um, we also have um, uh, a, 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 there's a variety of bills out there now um, to fund research, to fund um, uh, talent, and you know, let's let's hope that happens. So I think I mean, these are Republicans who are doing this. Mm -hmm. You know, who who for the last thirty years have said free markets solve all problems, as is you know, as Goldman Sachs made a lot of money, and, and American workers kind of lost out. Yeah, and that, I mean that's an interesting the sea change in how government support for economies um, is viewed. Maybe it, in the U.S., it's sort of because of the China issue, it predates the virus. But certainly, when I look at economies in in Europe and, and elsewhere, where there maybe wasn't that same level of animosity before. Do you think that that's one of the byproducts we'll see come out of the pandemic is, I mean, it's quite obvious that it is in certain areas like medical equipment, medical supplies, all that. But do you think that really the political will exists in the US on both sides of the aisle to get this done? And do you think it's actually realistic that 
that that's going to be a, a, something to come out of the pandemic? Well, I, I think that there, you know, uh, if you look at the Washington political establishment right now, it's one bipartisan issue, and that's China's a bad guy. And so they're all flailing and running around. But when you look at um, the business community, um, there's almost a dependence on, on the China market, in, especially for the best tech companies in the United States, because they have the biggest market share in China because they do stuff China can't do yet. You know, we have American chip companies that have two thirds of their sales in China or 50 percent of their sales in China or 60 percent of the sales in China, depending on the company. If they if they can't sell to China, those companies, well, the stock market collapses in the United States and they're replaced by the, the Koreans and the Japanese. So the I think business will will will, will be a, a kind of something that tethers everything together. But then we we have then we have to sort things out. Meanwhile, one of the one of, one of the uh, results of this pandemic is um, China's going to have to figure out how to build some trust in the world. Mm -hmm. China has lost all trust, and now that they're even even though China's going out now with all this PPE and all the medical help to like 110 countries, I'm told, um, they do it in such a ham-handed way because yeah. when you get it, you're supposed to have a press conference and praise China for doing it, and people are insulted and embarrassed by that. Then you got these wolf warrior diplomats going around acting like Tony Soprano um, <laughs> when when China's usually had um, a, a, a pretty elite core of diplomats who were self-effacing and humble and, and got things done. And now they're going out there. They're in everybody's face saying outrageous things. Mm -hmm. How is that going to build trust for China? This is, you know, uh, as, as bad as Trump is and as, as ridiculous as he is in the way he talks to the world. China has an opening now, but they're going around making everybody unhappy also. So, uh, I don't know, two peas in a pod, maybe. Yeah, I mean, that's that's something that struck me over recent months. You, the wolf warriors being one element of it, the PPE being another element of it, is that China is looking at an open goal and it's it's basically walking away from it. Do you see this as a sort of shift in attitude in China under the Xi Jinping reign where there are have become more aggressive. Um, you know, they're not necessarily as diplomatic as the the veteran diplomats. The, you know, some of the some of the guys. Uh, you know, the, we had people last week like Long Yong Tu, Xi Yong Hong, in Beijing come out and warn against this sort of um, attitude. So there seems to be a generational divide within, uh, you know, figures within within Beijing. So are you shocked to see that? that sort of, you know, fork in the road where you've got the younger um, generation of wolf warriors under Xi Jinping go off in one direction and then maybe the more establishment figures of old, you know, calling for, for some decorum and to hang on to these international systems which have aided China's growth over the last 40 years. Well, you know, I've watched this develop from the global financial crisis. The global financial crisis was in 2008 was really the turning point. Before that, um, and Chinese officials, you know, you'd have these American half-wit congressmen come in and lecture the Chinese and, you know, you've got to do this, you got to do that. And the Chinese officials would, you know, bite their tongue and, and say, thank you for your wisdom and probably go in the next room and hit their head against the wall. Uh, but they had to suck it up and listen to a lot of nonsense from outsiders. 2008, they said, hey, wait a second. Uh, we're not going to do that anymore. In fact, um, well, you got some payback coming. You better listen to us. Our yeah. system is, is you know, we, we now have confidence in our system and our system's better. And then that that has flowed into then into she being a strong man and also uh, this this hardline diplomacy. But, you know, I, I think it comes down to China was very good playing with an empty hand. Um, when you know, I think uh, Joe and Lai outmaneuvered Kissinger quite well in the early yeah. uh, in the early configuration of the relationship. Um, but once China got a full hand, they they overplay it. They just they they overplay it. They 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 go too far. And then when you've got a system with a top down system and you've got a hard line guy on the top, uh, you can't lose by being hard line. Mm. And you know the the uh, the uh, the diplomatic corps in China was set up to be um, like a civilian army. It, you know, it was it, it, the PLA looked at it as like their, their, their civilian branch almost. I have a friend who's writing a book on this that I've been, I've been reading a draft of, and it's pretty clear that 
um, I think they're just coming to where they back to their original purpose for diplomacy was to show strength around the world. Yeah. Well, you know, another point that I was wondering, China's um, exports as a percentage of GDP has been falling gradually over the years. Last year, it was 17.4. I think the year or two after it entered the WTO, it was around 33%. Do you get a sense as well that alongside the nationalistic um, tendencies of um, the Chinese system, there's also a sense that there's less to lose from acting as belligerently as it does? Like, you know, China doesn't necessarily... Of course, it it can't isolate itself from the international community, from the global trading system. 17.4% of the Chinese economy is still massive. But, like, is there a sense that, all right, we we don't need it as much as we are? We've got to the size and the capability and the strength that that China is today. Therefore, we can throw our weight around a wee bit more than we would have done five, even ten years ago around the financial crisis. Well, you know, back in November, December in Beijing, I was at an event with a number of retired senior Chinese officials, including cabinet ministers. And they were saying things to me like, look, um, we knew a fight would be coming. We knew America could could handle the differences in our system when we were small. But now that we're big, we knew America would not be able to handle it. Um, and we're ready for this fight. Um, and they, they were very uh, confident, let's say. They were saying things like, look, um, people are going to have to deal, figure out how to deal with us. Countries and companies, we are who we are. They're going to have to feel how they, you know, how they deal with us. That was pre-COVID, before China, um, through its own, um, in, you know, mistakes, ended up having the whole world uh, infected by this virus. Now, um, my business friends I talk to in China, the Chinese government has never been so nice. Uh, the mayors are coming in, the party secretaries are coming into foreign companies saying, what can we do for you? We, we want you in China. We need you. I think, you know, they need to be firing on all, on all cylinders. So it may be a cynical exercise, but I think China's kind of woken up to, wait a second, we are vulnerable and we got to get along. That's one part of it. But, uh, you know, the Wolf Warriors are still firing off on Twitter. Do you see that as a, some, something of a division between even at the top level in China? You know, uh, uh, I think since the j- days of Hu Jintao, when they started getting more hardline, um, there's been a division between the business bureaucrats and the, the diplomats um, and the others that kind of come straight up from the top. You know, they, they, they're on the ground they know, and, and they know that they need foreign business, they need foreign investment, they need foreign markets. But then you got the political stuff coming out of the party, which is very, very hardline. So, yeah, I think there are a couple streams there. Yeah. Just, Jim, to, to finish up quickly today, um, speaking to you on Wednesday evening, we had Chai and wen um, inaugurated for her second term in Taiwan. I know that you lived and work in, worked in Taiwan for a while. Um, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo sent his hearty congratulations for President Chai this uh, today. Do you feel, how, how do you view the situation in Taiwan with everything else that's kicking off between the U.S. and China Um, And Taiwan appearing in such a position of, I guess, diplomatic strength um, uh, that it has been for some time. Do you see this as another potential immediate flashpoint? Um, That's up to China, actually. I mean, Tsai Ing-wen is actually pretty reasonable. I've met her and spent time with her before she was president, you know, years ago. Um, she she understands uh, Taiwan's position on you know just how free and independent they can be or cannot be. They just want space to operate, and China just blocks them very heavy-handed at every turn. So if China is going to go very very hard at uh, the second uh, Tsai Ing-wen administration, um, then America I think is going to uh, stand this beside Taiwan because America feels like it has a moral obligation to Taiwan. You know, America has been connected to Taiwan since World War II. Um, America pushed Taiwan very strongly to become a democracy. It's now the first democracy in Chinese history. Um, you know, I, my personal opinion is the mainland should study Taiwan and see what they can learn for moving their own system ahead because it is the first Chinese democracy in, in history and it works. And I'm not, you know, China could, uh, I think, learn a few lessons from Taiwan, but I guess that's not going to happen anytime soon. And as uh, I guess we've got on one uh, hand the situation with Taiwan 
the inauguration of Tsai for her second term today and we've had different sorts of scenes in Hong Kong over the past few weeks. What's your um, view from your um, your outpost there, in uh, your uh, current outpost in, in the US, Jim, of how things have unfolded in Hong Kong over the past week or two? Well, let me talk over the last few years, Hong Kong. I just think Hong Kong is the only in, only city, only Chinese city whose best days are behind it. You know, it, it, it's going to be absorbed into the mainland. That border, border is going to be erased. The mainland systems are going to come into Hong Kong. I don't think there's much that can be done about it. Um, that is not a, a happy thing for the people of Hong Kong. But, um, you know, China's all about control. And they, they again, it's, it's always black and white with China. You know, it's it's this or that, um, and they they don't they don't handle nuance well, and they're a very paranoid government, and they know that they if they have demonstrations in Hong Kong, and they are accommodated, uh, they worry about that spreading around China. So it's it's really unfortunate for Hong Kong, and I wish I could say more positive things about Hong Kong. You know, I'm not an expert on Hong Kong; I spent a lot of time there, but this is just as an outside observer who's been watching China for 30 years. Um, I think that's the sad truth. Certainly, Jim. Well, thanks very much for sharing your views on that. And thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm happy to do it. Thanks for listening to this week's US-China Trade War Podcast. I've been Finbar Birmingham from the Political Economy Desk at the South China Morning Post. You can follow us on Twitter at SCMP Economy. I am at F Birmingham. That's B-E-R, not like the city. You can also keep up to date on all the news regarding the coronavirus, how it affects the economy, and of course, the US-China relationship at scmp.com. Looks like a busy week ahead here for us at the SCMP. We will fill you in on all the latest events this time next week. Stay safe. For more podcasts from the South China Morning Post, head to scmp.com, where you can hear more about technology, trade, culture, and society.